Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. Glad you're tuning in for episode 28. I hope everybody enjoyed the last couple of shows of coverage of the North American International Auto Show. Certainly was a fun time going down there and I look forward to the Toronto uh, version of that, the Canadian International Auto Show coming up in about three weeks time here in Toronto. I'll be going down to cover that and I look forward to that and hopefully see more of an EV presence. As I mentioned, it was a little lackluster in Detroit, but uh, you know, at least there was something. So let me get to some of the stories that I'm covering today. Now, one of the things, I, in fact, I talked to a few people when I was down in Detroit, uh, actually one of, the, one of the evenings when I went out with some folks for dinner. And one of the biggest challenges still facing electric cars uh, from adoption perspective is uh, affordability. Um, we were kind of hoping that prices would start falling a little bit more than they haven't really been in the last couple of years. Um, we know that battery prices have come down quite a lot over the last few years, especially when, when Nissan first launched the Leaf back in 2010. Uh, battery pack pricing was very, very high. I think it was over $1,000 per kilowatt hour or something like that back at that time US. And now, of course, we're trying to get to that magical $100 US uh, per kilowatt uh, hour pack, uh, as, as Elon, of course, is working towards for economies of scale. But uh, so even though they've come down quite a lot over the last uh, nine years now, uh, it still hasn't resulted in, in a dramatic in, a decrease in pricing for electric vehicles. Uh, ranges have gotten, uh, of course, larger, and that's what people want. So longer range, more infrastructure to promote adoption. So people have less of, a, of an excuse not to buy an EV that could fit their lifestyle. Um, but unfortunately, the pricing has still not come down. And that was one of the reasons, and that's one of the main reasons for EV incentives, be it the US federal tax credit, be it the, the gone Ontario EV incentive that we had here and, and tax incentives and breaks that are in other provinces and countries and states around the world. And a lot of them exist for that reason, because uh, something I've talked about many times being cost parity that was just not there yet when you look at a uh, similar equipped uh, EV and size and, and range and all that good stuff versus a, a very similar model from an ICE-V perspective. Um, there is just uh, so much of a price gap, uh, unfortunately, right now that, uh, you know, the prices haven't come down to what we call cost parity to make it even. Uh, obviously, that's you know going to hamper EV adoption. It's great to have more choice out there, but if they're dramatically more expensive than an ICE vehicle, it's a harder sales pitch, I guess, to talk to consumers about. Now, there's a survey of more than 22,000 EV drivers conducted by this organization called Plug Insights. And they conducted the survey and it looks like 45% of the EV buyers who bought long range EVs, like the Tesla and the Chevy Bolt, as an example, have a, uh, uh, a gross income of more than $200,000 a year. And I think this is a US survey, if I'm not mistaken. You know, I read comments and, and, and as I mentioned, in all the shows and forums and websites and stuff. And the, the general perception is that Teslas are for people that make a lot of money. And when you look at a survey like this, it actually substantiates and corroborates that particular statement. So it fits into that mold. And to try to spur adoption, we have to kind of change that. And we need manufacturers to bring their prices down in order to get to that that marketplace of a lot, a lot of buyers that want to get into EVs that simply can't afford it uh, because of those price points. Now, the Model 3 base unit is, is supposed to be one of the vehicles to help with that as well, but it's still long and coming. So hopefully they'll be able to get that out in 2019. Something to consider when you're talking to people, we have to try to change that mindset and let people know that there's more choice. So when I, when I comment about all this more choice, and I'm going to talk about some manufacturers coming up here in the show, it's all good. It's, it doesn't matter if it's Tesla or, or Nissan or Hyundai or Kia, whoever. The more the better and the more they can drive the price down, the better it is going to be for adoption and for consumers to get into EV ownership. Now, it's interesting. I had a conversation with a, a very renowned journalist in Detroit. Uh, there was a few Canadian contingents, including myself, that went down for the show and uh, was having an evening conversation with one of the journalists who is not very <laughs> much, not very supportive for electric vehicles. I, I won't won't say his or her name uh, out there, but it's and one of the, the um, elements that this person made as an argument was about the recycling of batteries that, you know, they can they harm the, the environment more than the savings of emissions are, and, and, and even that could be debatable. Well, this is a re article that came out uh, just after the show. It's interesting that I saw this article about the myth being busted that there are actually a lot of, of companies that are spinning up 
um, that are looking to uh, provide recycling of battery packs, uh, recycling and, and uh, reusing of some of the materials from battery packs as they start. I mean, you have to remember, folks, it's still an early in, uh, industry, right? I mean, Nissan has been out since 2010. Uh, Tesla started in 2012, you know, from, from, from selling a lot more cars. And it's only in the last few years that we're starting to see this plethora of, of electric cars that start coming to market and, and more volumes. You know, we hit 2 million, I think, um, EVs globally, about 2% of the market share this year, which, again, is, is the highest it's ever been. So and a lot of the batteries are, aren't at near the end of their life cycle yet. Even some of the older leases from 2010 are still chugging away to use that expression. So it's still a, a budding industry, but that there are companies that are spinning up to be able to handle safely uh, and, and easily to be able to recycle uh, to lessen any environmental damage that battery packs can provide when they're when they're done with their, their life cycle. And here's a company in uh, Dusenfield. Uh, it's a company called Dusenfeld in uh, uh, Vandenberg, Germany, if I pronounce that correct. And they figured out battery recycle situation way ahead of, of really the need. So they're kind of, they probably got a little bit of recycling they're doing, mean, nowhere near the volume that they expect to have at this point in time. But because, um, you know, a lot of companies say, ah, oh, it's very hard to recycle this stuff. And they're saying, not really. I mean, um, you know, rather than their approach is rather than using high temperatures to thermally de decompose the battery cells and burn their electrolytes, which I think is one of the ways to do that, this organization shreds or crushes and or crushes the modules after which the electrolytes simply evaporate so just using evaporate you know uh, normal evaporation to get rid of that and then magnets and oxygen are used together to separate any remaining substances and that's as technical as i'm going to go in this little piece here i just wanted to bring this to to your attention that if you are talking to somebody and they're mentioning well you know part of the reasons evs aren't good for the environment is because you got all these batteries that are going to end up in landfills let them know that that is not the case. That's actually a misnomer. And there's a lot of companies and a lot of organizations. And, you know, when you factor that into municipalities and automakers and everything that are looking to, to, to run fairly lucrative businesses in the automotive battery recycling, uh, the EV battery recycling arena. So they are coming on board. And it's not as complicated as some, some are leading you to believe. So uh, make sure you let them know that. Came across just a quick article from a uh, an organization in England called What Car, pretty big website, and they do a lot of YouTube videos, and I believe they might have a print magazine. I haven't gone to looked at that, but uh, they came out and named the Kia Nero EV the 2019 Car of the Year. Now, uh, I only wanted to bring this up. Uh, they their their basically response to this is that the uh, E Nero has been designed to merge crossover inspired design with long range zero emissions driving and enjoyable performance. Well, we already know that. And I just wanted to add my two cents and I'm going to officially announce that uh, the EV Revolution Show awards the 2019 Battery All-Electric Vehicle of the Year award to the Kia Nero EV. I've been saying that since last fall and I'm going to stick to my guns. I think, especially after seeing it in Detroit, talking to, to, talking to the Kia folks, actually having some time to sit. I mean, it couldn't drive it, of course, but I know how an EV drives. It's going to be very similar to a lot of the ones that I've driven already. Uh, I just think it's got a great balance of size, of power, of range, of appointments within the vehicle, and functionality, and uh, all, all around usefulness in that vehicle. I think it really hits a sweet spot, um, especially for the North American markets and Europe markets, because it's not too big for, for a lot of the spaces there. So there's my award. Uh, Kia, congratulations in winning the first inaugural EV Revolution Show Battery uh, EV of the Year Award goes to the 2019 Kia e Nero EV. So as you folks know, I've been uh, communicating about the, the BMS uh, for the Nissan LEAF. Uh, there's been some, some updates to the battery management system for the LEAF that have come out that have been uncovered by some folks. I reported about the Electric Suite earlier and uh, Lemon Tea LEAF, uh, my friend, good friend James, out in the UK who have done a lot of discovery work and Aaron Russell, of course, who I mentioned on another show. Well, it seems like Nissan has confirmed uh, that they have come out for a software. They're calling it a software fix or, or more of a patch situation for some of those 2018 LEAFs that are impacted by the throttling. Well, they all are impacted by the throttling, but a little bit more severe than I think some of the users want that to, to occur. So they do have an update apparently available, and these are going to, to be applicable for LEAFs that are meant that were manufactured between December 8, 2017 and May 9, 2018. Now, I'm not sure 
if this is just a North American manufacturer um, uh, scope or if it's a global, if it includes the UK plant and European shipments and Japanese plants, the Japanese plant and, and Asian pack shipments. I'm not sure. The way that this article is written, it looks like it's a generic uh, time frame. So I'm going to assume that it's it's basically at least a European and North American plants. I'm not sure about the Japanese. You'll have to check on that a little further if you're out there. Uh, but it seems like Nissan will be will be offering a, a an update to the battery management system um, for those Leafs impacted that were manufactured between those dates. Mine is one of those. Mine was manufactured in April of 2018, so I definitely fall within that range. So um, I don't know how Nissan's rolling this out. I've had a couple of questions and emails already come out since this article and with some people that I'm talking to. Uh, I don't know if they're just going to send a letter. It's, it's not a recall. It's nothing to do with safety. Uh, so they're going to they're going to uh, produce uh, or, or give this um, a software out there. I'm, it, obviously, it has to be done through the dealer because the, the 2018 Gen 2s don't have over the air like the, the E plus that will be coming out uh, later on this year will have. So I don't know if you'll get a letter or if you get an email from your, your Nissan dealer or from Nissan corporate in the region that you're in. Uh, I am trying to get more information on that, and as I do, I'll, I'll report an update on that, or I'll, t I'll tweet that out on my Twitter feed when I get more information. But, you know, good news. So if you are within that realm and you're interested in getting that update done, uh, please, I would encourage you to reach out to your local Nissan dealer, put your name in there at least so they're aware of that, uh, because it, a lot of people may not care. They may just, they don't, they don't really need it. Um, I know, as I mentioned, you know, in my use case, I've only had to rapid charge in nine months now five times like you know a handful of times so it doesn't really impact my use case it's kind of a nice to have okay so that way if i'm going to go somewhere and i'm going to need two or three successive rapids fast charging in a row then you know this software is going to help me get through that but it's something i don't use on a daily basis so there may be some other folks that feel the same way and that may not get this so i think it's going to be an optional uh, certainly update for you. But yet again, I'm glad that Nissan's come out and recognize that they want to be able to make that experience better for their customers. So they're going to come out with this. So contact your local dealer. And as I get more information, I'll let you know. A few manufacturers I want to talk about. None of them, uh, not really many of them that were at the Detroit show. I can tell you that. But there's a new teaser image that just came out from Honda ahead uh, of the Geneva Auto Show, which will be coming out shortly, uh, debuting uh, their EV prototype, of course. Uh, they, they came out a while ago with the Urban EV, and I've uh, featured that on a show last year. Um, a little bit more rounded, uh, kind of a little wider stance. I think a little more rounded kind of scheme, it looks like, on this uh, this this uh, sneak picture that's been leaked out um two-thirds and the honda uh, honda's electric vision which is part of their strategy um they're actually really going to push in the european markets they want two-thirds of the sales there by 2025 to be electrified in some way and that could be of course uh, could be a hybrid with some electric assist it could be a plug-in hybrid or full battery electric vehicle so when you say electrification it does kind of cover those three elements i'm hoping it's more battery only technology into evs rather than a mix but we'll take anything with a plug for now for sure um, so the mass production version of this car apparently will be on sale later this year i believe maybe starting in the european markets um, in the european markets to go and uh, here's some other images of course of some of the spy shots that came out a couple of months ago so they don't seem to be straying too far off the path um, but looks like it's going to be a four door rather than a two door um, and I think the other one had reverse opening doors or something. I think this will be more more normalish, but uh, good. I'm you know as I mentioned before, I'm glad Honda's finally getting into the game and they're going to pursue electrification more. Uh, they're they're behind just like Toyota is. So let's hope they can catch up and get some good stuff uh, out to the marketplace. Speaking of facelifts, no, not mine, but the Smart EQ uh, has a new facelift coming. Uh, it looks like in the fall of this year, and they're going to update it with some more range. Here's some pictures behind me now. I I'm 100% sure it's not going to have glass doors that this picture shows. Uh, but obviously, if you can look at the, the roundness and some of the design elements there, I think they're going to be incorporated into some new fascia and some new uh, some new body uh, structures from that perspective. It's, it's got to be safe. It's got to pass all the tests, of course. Uh, right now, the it's rated at 57 miles for the Smart EQ all-electric version, about 92 kilometers at EPA range. Hopefully, Daimler... Well, Daimler, of course, has stopped building the... Um, ice powered version of the smart um, in a lot of markets not in all their markets yet but in most of those they're going to all electric now um, and uh, this 2019 upgrade should start coming out in the fall 
Um, it uh, may there may be a 4.4 right now it's a 4.2 model there may be a 4.4 model which will be a little bit stretched version of that as well that's in that potentially is rumored um, and we're hoping that or I'm hoping that they're going to improve the smart by at least doubling the battery capacity because they talked about that a couple of years ago as as where they wanted to take that vehicle uh, and of course which would add to, significantly to the range um, right, so it might come with something like a 30 kilowatt hour battery pack compared to the current 17.6 kilowatt hour pack, which of course would offer a great range for extending the urban runabout type of feel. I mean, I see a lot of smart cars driving on the highway, going on open highways across uh, cities from city to city as well. They're not just for urban uh, cars, uh, urban use, but obviously they're great for those those areas where you can zip in and out of parking spots and find something nice and tight in there from a parking and and uh, and just getting around a lot easier than having to, to drive a larger vehicle. So uh, I hope that uh, uh, Daimler uh, continues down that path and uh, hopefully we'll start seeing something maybe at one of the uh, spring or summer or early fall auto shows come out for this. And finally, in a little bit shortened show today, I got one more manufacturer that just came. I got this article just today before I started taping was BMW. And I've talked about the i4 at length before, but there seems to be some new pictures that have surfaced uh, recently about it looks like there's a shipment of some i4s in camel gear that are on a truck that somebody snapped a bunch of pictures of. Now, the i4 is based on BMW's iVision Dynamics concept car, which debuted in 2017 at the Frankfurt Motor Show. Um, and it's an all-electric version of their i-series uh, sedan platform. Uh, so these spy shots are what uh, this organization, what I would agree with, believe to be a production, an early production prototype of the i4. Um, the synopsis on this is that uh, they're going to be capable of 0 to 60 or 0 to 62, if you want to get precise, 0 to 100 kilometers an hour, 62 miles an hour in about four seconds, so pretty quick. Uh, top speed of 120 miles per hour, whatever that is in, in kilometers, you can figure it out, but certainly well enough for the German autobahns to keep up. And uh, of course, a zero emission range of about 373 miles. Obviously, if you're on the autobahn doing uh, 210 kilometers an hour, you're not going to get that kind of range, but you'll you'll be able to go fast for some time. Um, so it looks like it's still a couple of years away from from actually getting into full production and into showrooms. There might be two specs to this vehicle: a a rear wheel drive and an all wheel drive version, which would be similar to BMW's platforms today. Um, it looks like again the ETA would be sometime in 2020, uh, probably the latter part of 2020, if I'm guessing at this point. But I'm hoping that it's sooner because I really think that this is going to be take a good swipe at the Model Three and that market segment of the midsize luxury sedan, which is where the Model 3 is just kind of shining right now and will continue to shine for, for some time with not a lot of competition in that market space because most manufacturers are focusing on the SUVs and pickup trucks now and some of the bigger vehicles, of course, for the margins. So uh, let's hope that comes out. Now, BMW has stated, of course, that this is part of their plan to provide 25 electrified cars by the year 2025 with 12 of them being fully electric. And that's only six years uh, since really they only have one today. Uh, fully electric. If you remember some of the Model 3 shows, Trevor and I were talking about 2020 back in 2016, that it was going to be a monumental year for, you know, even a further paradigm shift for EVs as far as that, the amount of availability of platforms and vehicles on the road. And, and all signs continue three years later to point in that same direction that 2020 is going to be a banner year. But uh, there'll be a lot of stuff so a lot of rumblings this year to set us up for 2020. So let's, uh, I'll keep my eye on BMW and all the other manufacturers and continue to report what I find. Well, that's it for this quick edition of the EV Revolution Show, episode 28. Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, I've got all the uh, contact information following me on this. I'm going to shorten that segment down a little bit so that it's coming right up on how you can reach me. So please reach out to me through those mechanisms and subscribe if you haven't. And until the next show, uh, please, everybody stay safe. Keep warm because it's uh, we're getting a nice chill now here in North America and from what I'm hearing in other parts of the world. So stay warm, stay safe, and until next time, I'll see you then.